Well, thanks, Jenny, and it's um, great to be back in Liverpool. I think the last time we were here was shortly after the last general election, and we were adjusting to life in government and realizing we were absolutely central to the country's political and economic future, forming a stable government to deal with a national economic emergency. But the last few years have been tough for all of you. And even if those of us in the privileged position of being at the center of government are forced to confront the question, you know, has it been worth it? For the country, absolutely. But for the party, my question is answered as this way. Yes, unambiguously. And let me tell you a story about my last five days, which in a nutshell captures what Liberal Democrats have done in government in the last five years. On Tuesday, to celebrate Apprenticeship Week, and having delivered over two million apprenticeships in this parliament, I took two apprentices to cabinet. And these were two young women who were pursuing apprenticeships in mechanical and software engineering. One had stellar A-levels, but she'd chosen the apprenticeship route instead. They were both passionate uh, and eloquent about the opportunities they now had. And five years ago, this event could not have happened because apprenticeships were uncommon and they were low status. They were seen as a second best option for those who had failed at school. But Liberal Democrats in government insisted on the back of the painful decisions we had to make over tuition fees that more resources should be plowed into good vocational training for the 60% who don't go to university. And as a result, the number of apprenticeships has doubled, quality has risen, and there's been a massive transformation in attitudes. Apprenticeships are now seen as a serious career option. Now, when the Tories talk about this, they say this is what they call a coalition success story. If you uh, look in the coalition dictionary, this is Tory speak for here is a successful Lib Dem policy, which we weren't too keen on to begin with, but it plays well with our focus groups, and we'd now like to own it. <laughs> and I think the Tories would also like to own my second Lib Dem success story, which was an event to celebrate the sustained drive for gender equality and a commitment to double the proportion of women on the boards of FTSE 100 companies to 25%. And this year, we will meet the target. And every FTSE 100 company already has a woman on the company board. Now, we know there's a lot more to do, but a glass ceiling has been broken thanks to Liberal Democrats in government. And I was fortunate enough this week to celebrate the women who have reached the top of the business world since 2010. And it was a very proud moment. The third this event this week touched me deeply also. It stemmed from the work that Paul Burstow and Norman Lamb have done with, with Nick Clegg's encouragement to focus attention and resources on the problems around mental illness. It addresses the needs of the one in six members of the workforce who've got mental illness or stress-related conditions. And the cost of them and society are absolutely vast. Now, some of you uh, will already know my own story. Uh, I had a mother who experienced a long incarceration in a mental hospital when I was 10, after the birth of my younger brother, suffering from what's now called postnatal depression. And she was cured in due course and absolutely critical was the help of adult education, where she rediscovered a world of learning that she'd had to abandon at 15 to work on the production line in the chocolate factory. And therefore, I was delighted and moved to be able to announce last week that 145 adult education colleges and other institutions had bid for a 20 million pound fund 
which we secured from the Treasury with, with, with Danny's help, to provide adult education colleges to help the mentally ill back in society. And between these events, I was invited to open the Stock Exchange and celebrate Britain's thousand fastest growing companies. This is an embodiment of our business-led recovery. And at the reception, I met somebody I'd visited earlier in the Parliament. It was a West Midlands company making castings for the car industry. And back in 2010, he was really seriously struggling but now he's booming on the back of our successful drive to revive manufacturing, which we've led in my department. And the industrial strategy, which Liberal Democrats launched in government, has created a solid framework for long-term collaboration between business and government to build up British industry and its supply chains. And it's so successful that both Labour and the Tories now want to be part of it, as of course they should be. And lastly, I gave a speech this week to launch a new innovation centre, and it took me back to my first day as a cabinet minister. In between the Queen and the cabinet and David Cameron's first, and I have to say last visit to my department, um, <laughs> I I was, um, I was deluged with advice, but there was one idea that really grabbed me, which was how to bring to Britain what the Germans do brilliantly well, which is converting science into new technologies. Britain has been great at science, but less so at innovation. And this is now changing very fast because I acted on that advice. And we now have centers for innovation in advanced manufacturing and seven others from offshore renewable technology to cell therapy to new transport systems like driverless cars. And these centers, what we call catapults, are becoming the envy of the world, including the Germans. So we've had five events in one working week out of five years in government. But these highlights are just some of the things we've been able to achieve in office. In five years, I have been able, with Nick's constant support and the work of Ed Davey, Joe Swinson, Norman Lamb, Jenny Willett, who've worked with me in my department, to achieve a vast amount to create a genuinely responsible modern capitalism. We have, for example, brought in binding shareholder votes on executive pay. We've legislated for shared parental lead and flexible working. We've made company reporting more transparent, created a public register of company ownership. We've promoted employee share ownership. We've strengthened legislation against cartels and to protect consumers. We've brought in legally binding codes to support small business, that is farmers from supermarkets, pubs from pub co's, and cash-strapped small companies from late payers. We've legislated against abuse of zero hours contracts, and we've greatly strengthened enforcement of the minimum wage. We've negotiated and agreed a multilateral arms trade treaty, and I've been able to use export controls to stop the export of drugs used in capital punishment in the United States. Now, <laughs> and much of this, I have to say, was in the face of Tory opposition. And indeed, the Tories have spent the last five years promoting the idea of hire and fire legislation and trying to end the right to strike. And we saw them off. And, I think what this shows is that our party is unenshavedly pro-business, but we're also pro-consumer and we're pro-worker. What I want to talk about now specifically is about the future of economic policy. Not just what we've achieved, but what we aim to achieve. And to win this argument, we have to have a vision, not just a narrative about the past. And we're still dealing with some of the toxic legacy of the financial crisis 
which is what has was, got us into government in the first place. Um, of course, there is a cleaning up job still to be done from reducing the post-crisis deficit and from finishing the reconstruction of the banks. But beyond these hygiene factors, there is a bigger task. And I want to set out how we now progress from rescue to recovery to a truly great British industrial renaissance. Now, our opponents show very little sign of grasping the magnitude of what is required. They promise lavish tax cuts or spending out of money they don't have to give electoral bribes to their favorite demographics. It, it used to be just uh, the Greens and UKIP who we mocked because their economic policies involved repealing the laws of arithmetic. <laughs> now, And you know the story, cutting taxes, increasing spending, and reducing budget deficits all at the same time. But now this fantasy world has been mainstreamed by Labour and the Conservatives. And the consequences for fairness are just utterly perverse. We've just emerged, for example, from a disastrous banking crisis in which the leading villains were the investment bankers. But the main winners from the promised Tory tax cuts would be retired investment bankers. <laughs> and the main winners from Labour's new university finance policy would be the investment bankers of the future. <laughs> so, so how do we build a stronger economy? How do we do better? We've made a start in government. Britain is an emerging success story with rising employment and production. But we've had false dawns before. We need an economy which no longer depends on home consumption, fueled by debt and housing inflation, but it's driven by investment and exports and industrial success. And to achieve this, we need a much stronger skills base. We're chronically short of all kinds of engineers, at professional and technical level. We're short of construction skills, from site managers to bricklayers, digital skills in coding, systems design, and much else. Now, we should welcome talented people from overseas to perform these roles, but we mustn't let the British economy become like the Premier League, where the top clubs, even in Liverpool, are stuffed with bought-in talent, and there's barely enough homegrown players to make up a decent national team. Hence the need for a vast effort to raise the level of vocational skills training in Britain. Now, I referred earlier to our success in creating an apprenticeship revolution. And to carry this revolution forward will require more support from government, particularly building up large number of higher apprenticeships to degree level. And every pound we spend on one of these apprenticeships generates 18 pound for the national economy. Skills investment is a no-brainer. We also need to build on our commitment to innovation and science because our competitors are pouring money into research and development. So we need to double the innovation budget to get close to the average of our main competitors. And we've got to grow our science base alongside it. And it isn't just about spending money. If we're going to nurture our own science base in Britain, we can't allow company takeovers that are driven by short-term financial logic and tax breaks, which, of course, destroy that company. And that's why we need a new public interest test for takeovers which safeguard the science based in which so much taxpayers' money has been invested. And none of this can work unless companies, especially small and medium-sized companies, have got access to finance. Seven years after the banking crash, many companies still struggle to get finance to expand. To deal with this problem, Liberal Democrats in government have delivered the Business Bank, which has so far got out over £3 billion to small, medium-sized companies. 
We've delivered the Green Investment Bank, which has generated six billion of private and public investment in green projects. And the, re and the Regional Growth Fund, which has invested a billion pound and generated three billion more in private investment. Now the point in this story is that public and private investment work well together. Unlike the other parties, we in the Liberal Democrats do not see one as the enemy of the other. As a consequence, our successful interventions have got to be scaled up. And RBS must not return to private ownership until it's strong enough to support lending to the real economy and fully repays the taxpayer investment. We have a, a vision of a British industrial renaissance in which financial institutions stop operating like casinos and there is adequate long-term investment, both private and public. Now, we're now seeing a welcome recovery in private business investment. But badly needed public investment in public transport, in social housing, and science and skills is being held back. Now, the Tories will say, government can't borrow more for investment. But this is foolish economics. It surely depends what the borrowing is for. Borrowing for productive investment is not the same as borrowing to pay for salaries and benefits. It generates the future income to make debt sustainable. Simple common sense, as any business understands. And at a time when interest rates, the cost of government borrowing, are very low, it is simply negligent not to invest in our future. It's critical, too, that we don't turn our backs on the world. The Tories have a very strange split personality. On one hand, belief in free market economics, and on the other, nationalism, or at least English nationalism. A century ago, they believed in closing down trade, protectionism. Now they try to throw obstacles in the way of highly skilled Indian software engineers, or Brazilian students, or Chinese business visitors, all in order to meet some ludicrous, unobtainable target set for them by Nigel Farage or Migration Watch. And, uh, and their fear of UKIP has led them into the cul-de-sac of the EU referendum. Potentially years of uncertainty which will scare off, scare off many of the inward investors who want to retain or bring jobs here for British workers. And if the result's negative or even close, it will leave Britain in a no man's land, diminished, marginalized, and irrelevant. Now we know there are many sensible, moderate conservatives who are horrified by what their party is becoming. And we can offer them a home. just as we can to social democrats, increasingly disillusioned with Labour. The message from our opponents is a negative one. They define themselves by what they are against. Labour's default position is anti-business, and this is madness in a country that depends on business to create wealth and jobs. The Tories have got a lot of answers, right? They don't like trade unions. They don't like people on benefits. They don't like multiculturalism. I've called this an attack on workers, shirkers, and burkers. <laughs> By comparison, we, we have something positive to sell on the doorstep. There's a real record of achievement which demonstrated what those people who are armed with liberal and social democratic values can achieve concretely in government. Now we know there's much more to be done, but we can now see, thanks to Liberal Democrats in government, the outlines of an economy that is strong and sustainable, and a business culture that is long-term and socially responsible. So let's take this proud record to the country. Thank you.